morning, Magnolia Baptist Church family. This is Travis Hoke here coming to you live on Facebook Live from the sanctuary here at Magnolia Baptist Church. And, and I just want to say it's a beautiful day in here, here in the church. Uh, the sun's shining through the windows. And I thought this would be a great shot today to kind of have the light streaming through here and uh, just remind us of uh, what we're missing by not being able to miss uh, to meet in, in the building. But we, we trust that we'll be able to meet again real soon and look forward to that. Last week we had a, a great turnout for our uh, drive-in service for Easter, so I'm thankful for everyone who made an effort to come out and be a part of that. And if you were a visitor here with us that day, um, we're so glad you decided to be here with us. And uh, apologize for not being able to go around and introduce ourselves, but there again, according to the uh, social distancing, we we're supposed to keep our uh, keep our distance from that. But we're so thankful you're here with us, and for anyone who's here with us today, we. I uh, just want to say hello to you, and if you'd like to drop a comment there on our Facebook page, feel free to do so. We'd love to get to know you better, and um, just look forward to uh, what the Lord's going to do with us here today. Um, not a lot in terms of announcements. We're continuing on with uh, not having church until the restrictions are, are released, so we will continue to do services such as this through Facebook Live, and then... Uh, the video will be then placed on YouTube for anyone who doesn't have Facebook Live. So if you want to go to YouTube and uh, watch the video or recommend anyone see the video on YouTube, uh, you can go to Magnolia Baptist Church Stedman and find the video there a little bit later today. Um, prayer requests, we just want to be in prayer for our nation as a whole, for the, the wisdom for our leaders to make the, the decisions that they need to make, especially in the time of, of what we're going through right now. Uh, I know there's a couple families that... Uh, have some unspoken prayer requests and I definitely want to be praying for them today and for, the, for this week for the things that they're going through. Uh, pray for those who have lost a loved one. I know there's been a few that's lost some loved ones and, and those who are sick. Pray for, for God's healing in their lives and um, and as I mentioned earlier, the, those who are uh, having some treatments this week, Lord, for the, the, the wisdom of the doctors that they take care of them and and uh, that they'll heal quickly from that and, and come back. But uh, I encourage anyone, if they have any prayer requests that they would like the church to know about, that, that please uh, leave a comment here on the church's Facebook page, or you can call and leave a message at uh, the church office, and we'd we love to hear from you guys and, and be praying for you for, in this week in, in some way. Um, the title of my sermon for today is A Hope for Restoration. You should see it listed there on, your, on the Facebook page, A, a Hope for Restoration. And it's, uh, the sermon passage today is Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 through 14. And uh, Jeremiah is one of those unique books because <clears throat> it's a lot of judgment that's being placed on the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, for sins that they have committed. But in the midst of the book of Jeremiah, and even in the midst of the book of Lamentations, we find glimpses of hope that God gives the people for what he's going to be doing in them then and also in the future and that's what we want to look at today is this hope for restoration that he gives to the people of israel now most of my sermons i try to find a little story a little joke to kind of start us out today so i found one this is not necessarily meant to be funny but it kind of will help set the stage for what we want to talk about and the story goes like this it says a friend of mine awoke one morning to find a puddle of water in the middle of his king-size waterbed now can you imagine how disastrous that would be. A puddle of water in the middle of his kid's king-size waterbed. And it says, in order to fix the puncture, he rolled the heavy mattress outdoors and filled it with more water so he could locate the leak more e easily. Now, the problem was that he rolled it outdoors on top of a hill at his house, and the enormous bag of water was impossible to control and began rolling down the hill to the bottom of the yard where it rolled into a clump of bushes which ended up poking more holes into the mattress of his waterbed. So disgusted, this friend threw out the waterbed frame and moved a standard bed into his room. And then the next morning he awoke to find a puddle of water in the middle of his bed again, only to find out that the upstairs bathroom had a leaky drain. Can you imagine what that would have been like for him? to discover that he had gotten rid of this magnificent bed, settled for a standard bed, only to find out that the problem was somewhere else, that uh, um, he was still being tried in a manner of speaking for, uh, for what he was going through. You know, as I um, was writing this sermon, I came up, uh, this old statement came into mind, and I wanted to discuss it briefly, 
And I'm sure many have heard this, and it's this saying this. It says, that which doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. Now, I know we've probably not heard that verbally said to any of us, or maybe some have, but I'm sure it's been implied over a lifetime. Because whether it's been a circumstance that, you know, we've had faced, like maybe we, we lost a job, or we lost a loved one, or um, we faced some sickness, or, or maybe it's like most of us when we were growing up and we had dealings with our parents. If you had parents like me, you probably heard this phrase a lot, and that was this, you'll get over it. Well, get over what? Well, typically what they're saying is you're going to get over what you're going through, that hardship that you're going through, this time of trial in your life. And the fact is, is that you know, we, we all do to go through these trials. We have to go through some things that we don't want to. And you see, teenagers, they face that a lot, don't they? If you've ever had teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. Essentially, you'll get over it means that you will survive. When our parents were telling us, to, that to us when we were growing up, they were saying, you will survive. And when we say that to our children growing up, we're telling them the same thing. And ultimately, we're saying that you will be stronger for it, that this too shall pass. And I can say that with confidence because as I've grown up, and I'm sure many of us have been growing up, we've been able to look back over our lives and we've been able to see where those words have become a reality for us because ultimately, we did get over it, didn't we? Ultimately, that too did pass. We faced that trial, that struggle, and that hardship that we thought was so terrible at that time. And although we didn't like it, ultimately we were made stronger for it in the end. Well, today I'd like to discuss three things with you from this scripture passage in Jeremiah 29, 10-14 that relates directly to our lives in this sanctifying process that we go through, that oftentimes we do go through indeed, and God is making us more like Jesus through these things. There's three things I want to discuss. The first is the promise of hardship. The second is the promise of deliverance. And then the third is the promise of relationship. So if you have your Bibles with you, please look with me in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 through 14. I'm reading from the ESV today, and this is what God is saying through the prophet Jeremiah to the people of Israel. <clears throat> it says in verse 10, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise, and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. Verse 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you in the exile. If you would go to, go to the Lord with me in prayer. Father, thank you that we can... Despite the circumstances that we're in, Father, we can still meet as a church family, Father. Lord, we know that the building is not the church, it's the people of the building, the people who have placed their faith in you, that is the church. And Lord, we're thankful that given the technology that we have today, that we can meet together, Father, that we can open your word together amongst ourselves, Father, and we can see what you want us to know and, and, and see and apply and understand out of your word today, Father. Thank you for giving us a beautiful day. Thank you for the springtime, for the reminder of restoration, the, the reminder of and then the promise of new life, Father, and, and of your mercy and of your grace. And Father, as I mentioned earlier, there's many on the prayer list that we want to be praying for. We pray for them, Lord, each individually, Father, and you know their needs, that you'll we'll be with them, Father, that you'll guide the, the surgeons and guide the doctor's hands as they meet with these individuals, Father, and as they treat them, Lord, I pray that you give them wisdom to do the right thing, Lord, and I pray that the, the surgeries and the, and the treatments will go well, Lord, and and that they will recover quickly from these things. We pray for those who may be facing discouragement, Father, those who may be depressed or, or just down, Father. We pray for them, Lord, that you would give them encouragement, Father. Remind them that you are God and that you are in control and that you have a plan for everything. Father, we pray for our, our church family, Lord, that we'll be able to meet again soon in person, Father, to be able to encourage one another. And I pray that during this time we'll see the importance of what it means to do just that, Lord. Because we are not to forsake our, the, the meeting of, our, of ourselves together because we see that now when we don't do that, we miss it. I pray for our leaders, Father, to give them wisdom as they deal with this pandemic, Lord, to make the, the right decisions. I do pray that this will end quickly, Lord, and, 
that people will be able to get back to the normal routines of life. And I pray for those who are sick and, and dealing with this, Lord, or any other sickness they may have, Lord, help them through that, Lord. Grant them healing, Lord, and, and the ability to go home. And ultimately, Father, I pray, Lord, as we open your word today, that you would just open our eyes and Lord, help us to see what you want us to see, Lord, and open our ears so we can hear it, Lord, and then our brains so we can understand it, but most importantly, open our hearts so we can apply it to our lives today. And be with me, I pray, Father, help me to, Lord, just speak your words only and not mine. I, I don't want to say anything of my own accord. Just let it be you speak through me today. Lord, the Bible says that your word will, will go forth and it will not come back void. It will do that what you want it to accomplish, and I pray that it will do that today, Father. Help me, Lord, just to be your servant, Lord. I just want to be along for the ride. Work through me today, Father, to do your will. And thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first point I want to discuss today is the promise of hardship. So when we think about hardships, what do we think about? What we think about hardships as being oftentimes things that we don't like to go through, things that are hard for us to deal with, uh, and it can be anything, as I mentioned earlier. It could be sickness or the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job. It could be really anything else. The truth about hardships is that we all go through them. And there is not anyone who is exempt from walking through this life without facing some sort of a trial or a hardship. You know, sure, we can look at some people, and we have, and we can say, well, those people are blessed. God has really blessed them. I bet they never go through anything bad in their life. And we'd be foolish to say that because the truth is, is that although they are blessed, we all are blessed in some way. Are we not? But we all still face, face hardships. We all face struggles. No one is exempt from those things. And many times, you see, God allows these hardships, these trials, these things in our lives due to sin that's in our lives. So for instance, if there's sin in our lives, God brings these things in our life to, to bring that to light for us so we can see that, repent of it, and get back into that right relationship with Him that we need to be. But at other times, the circumstances in which we live brings about those hardships. So in essence, it's kind of like a guilt by association. If we live in a culture that's a sin-laden culture, then when God brings judgment upon that culture, brings a hardship upon that culture, we experience part of that with them. And other times, God brings hardship because he needs to sanctify us, to make us more like Jesus. And that's what our scripture passage today talks about. If you look at the people of Israel, he says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years on, you think about that, 70 years. 70 years is a really long time, but it's also time that goes by very quickly. But for many people, 70 years is a lifetime. But that's exactly how long the Lord, speaking through Jeremiah, tells the people that they're going to be captive in Babylon. You see, they were exiled to Babylon, as I said before, because of their sin. That's why they were sent there. The nation of Israel, as a people, they had brought upon themselves this severe punishment and judgment by turning away from their covenant with God and worshiping idols. Many had died, and, and Jerusalem and many surrounding towns and villages were destroyed. And then there was this remnant that was left, and God sent them into exile in Babylon. So ultimately, times were bad. I don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind that to read those passages of Scripture that they could say, well, gee, there's a light somewhere shining in that tunnel, isn't it? No, times were bad. And I think we've all experienced times like that. Times where maybe we feel far from the Lord due to some circumstances that we're going through. Or you know, maybe we have felt defeated sometime in our life. Or maybe we've even felt destroyed that we have nowhere to turn. We're so broken down that we're scraping the bottom of the barrel, if you know what I mean by saying that. You see, they and us at different times, have, I believe, have hit rock bottom. And that's not a fun place to be. I'm sure as Israel is sitting here in exile in Babylon that they felt that they had hit rock bottom. But then God says something like this in the remainder of verse 10. God says, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. You see, here in the south, it's springtime. You know, that time when it's spring one day, the next day you just don't know really what it is. You know what I mean? Like one day it's in the 50s and the next day it's in the high 80s. So you really can't plan to decide what you're going to wear because the weather changes so quickly and so often. Much less you really can't plan what you're going to do. 
Then you have what we had earlier this week, which you look down here now around Stedman or Fayetteville, you know that we had some pretty bad storms early Monday morning and about uh, and really high winds and, and those winds and rains, they come and they make a wreck of your yard. They blow limbs out of trees and leaves out of trees and, you know, and they just make a mess of everything. And so you spend your time out in the yard and you're cleaning your yard up and you're picking up all those sticks. And that's what I was doing Monday evening. I was out in the yard picking up sticks. And the more I picked up sticks, the more I found that I had to pick up. And it was high. And, and the longer I picked, the more frustrated I became with picking up those sticks. But here's the point that I want to make. You see, nothing really revives you when you're working that hard out in the hot sun. Nothing really revives you. Nothing really refreshes you than the promise of a cold drink that's waiting for you at the end of that job. So here are the people of Israel. Keep in mind they're in exile. Here are the people of Israel suffering in exile. And Jeremiah had pointed out to them earlier to not expect this time to be short. Because the Bible says that there was false prophets among the people of Israel and Babylon. And they were telling them, hey, it's going to be over soon. You're going to be back doing the same thing that you were doing before. It's going to be okay. And Jeremiah says, they're wrong. You're going to be there for a while. You're going to be there for 70 years. So give your sons and daughters away in marriage. Build houses. Multiply. And you see, for them that was difficult. Because that meant for them that a whole generation was going to be lost. They were going to be lost away from where they were supposed to be. And see, for me, I think of that as kind of like looking up from where you're picking up six in your yard. And then you realize that you still have a whole lot of yard left to pick up. You know what I mean? You're sitting there, you're looking forward to being done and having a nice cold drink and you look up and realize you still have a long ways to go. That's what I think the nation of Israel was experiencing at that time, that they had a long ways to go. But then Jeremiah says that God would visit them at the end. That he would keep his promise to them and bring them back home. Now, how refreshing and how encouraging would that be? Think about this. You know, when you're doing a job like that or when you're going through that dark tunnel or the valley of the shadow of death, when you can see that light at the other end of that tunnel or that valley or at the end of that job that you're working on, how does that make you feel to know that there's something there you're working towards? How do you think they felt? How would you feel? We can, and I think that we do, we experience those things today. We go through these hard times. We go through these trials, each and every one of us. But yet, when we spend time in God's words, we are reminded of that light that's there at the end of the tunnel, that light that's at the end of the valley that we're going through. And we're reminded that God has not forgotten us, that he will keep his promises. That's why it's so important to spend time in the word of God. Because we are reminded when we spend time in God's word of his promises. If you don't, you lose sight of them. And you see, this is how, this is one of the ways that God works when he works with people. God assures us, God assures us in our present situation by telling us now what he's going to do later. And what that means is that he gives us a hope now by giving us something to look forward to in the future. Now, he doesn't promise that this valley that we're going through, that this tunnel that we're traveling through is going to be easy, does he? He's not promising that it's going to be easy at all. But, and usually it's not, but he gives us something to look forward to, doesn't he? Let's look at a couple of examples from the Bible. You know, God promised Abraham in Genesis that he would later have children and that he would have multitudes born to him. He would have, uh, his, his seed would be like the sand by the seashore. And that they would inherit the land and that they would have a blessing. But what was that promise for? Was it for Abraham's present or the future? It was for the future. All things that have not yet been fulfilled yet. God promised David that he would have an everlasting kingdom. But David knew that he was going to die and that this kingdom would be a future kingdom. And then Jesus told his disciples that they later would have a home in heaven. Something that was not in the present, but would come only after they died. So it was a future promise. And you see, raising kids can be kind of just like that, you know. Uh, with our kids being at home and having to be schooled at home, we've all experienced some difficulties with that, I'm sure. <clears throat> um, 
And we, and we try to encourage our kids to do well, to work hard. And if they're not doing schoolwork, we encourage them to do chores, to do work at home. And sometimes we have to offer them this apple, this, this encouragement, this something to look forward to, to help them through the stuff that they don't want to do now. You know, we do that with Ethan, my oldest son. Ethan, uh, he, he doesn't like schoolwork a whole lot. And trying to get him to sit still for any amount of time can be quite difficult, as it is for any kids. And, and for him, why learn to read when someone else is going to read to you? Makes sense, right? Completely logical. So we give him something to look forward to, something to encourage him in the midst of what he's doing now by giving him something to look forward to and, and receiving that in the future. And that's how God works for us. He gives us something to look forward to in the future so that we can get through our present circumstances now. Which leads to our second point, the promise of deliverance. Well, what is this promise, this apple that God gave the people of Israel to look forward to? Well, it's the same promise that God gave to Abraham long ago in Genesis. It was a promise of children and a promise of land as an inheritance. God tells them that he will visit them and fulfill his promise to them and bring them back. They would return. They would be established again in the land of Israel. And God's covenant promises would flow once again to them. But is that all that God promised within that promise, if you know what I mean by saying that? Well, the answer is no, because the bigger implication is found in verse 11. The verse that many people use as their life verse. A verse that many people turn to and say, I, I like this verse for what it says. And this is what verse 11 says. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now see... The purpose of God's plan was not ultimately for destruction. It was for restoration. It was for a future and a hope. The people had to face God's discipline. And when they did, this discipline, which was punitive, which was punishment for their actions, then they then would be brought into restoration because it put them back in a place where they need to be to receive God's blessings. Do you believe that God wants to bless you in your life today? I believe that's a question we can ask everybody. And most people will say, well, yeah, I, I believe that God wants to bless me. They have read the Bible some or they've heard just enough of it to think that all God really wants to do in their life is to bless them. Many would say that God wants to give them their best now as a foretaste of what's going to come in eternity. All you have to do is name it and claim it. Now my question to that is, was that really true? You think about it. What happens if you name it and claim it? What happens if you're expecting a blessing from God and you don't get it? What do you tend to do? You tend to look at yourself and say, well, what's wrong with me then? I don't have enough faith for God to give me this obvious blessing that I'm desiring. But is that true? Well, no, it's not. Because we all face God's discipline. We all face God's judgment. I believe most of us would have to disagree with that statement that I said earlier that God wants to play, um, that we have to name it and claim it. And if we don't, we don't get what we desire, that there is something that's wrong with it. I believe that we would have to disagree with that because if we experience, if what we experience now is a foretaste of what's going to be in eternity, many of us would be able to ask ourselves this question, where did I fall off the boat then? Because obviously, if this is what I have to look forward to in eternity, heaven's not as great as I thought it was going to be. You see, what this text presents to us is this biblical truth, that God's promises are for the future. Yes, God can bless you now, and of that I have no doubt. I know that he does. But the ultimate promise and the fulfillment thereof is fulfilled only in eternity through Jesus Christ. And God promised the people of Israel that he would give them a future and a hope. But where is the fulfillment of that promise today? In this text we're looking at, that is, this is several years ago in the past, several thousand years ago in the past. So where is the fulfillment of that promise today? Yes, as the children of Abraham, they have been promised an inheritance of land. And they will get it. But here's the thing, if you read the Bible and you look in the book of Numbers, you see where God tells Moses, this is the borders of the land that I've given the nation of Israel. And guess what? They have never in the history of the world, if you study biblical history, they have never in the history of the world occupied all of that land. So is God slacking his promise? Is he not going to keep it? 
No, he will one day. That promise will be fulfilled. Look at David. David was promised to have an everlasting kingdom. David knew that he was going to die. So is there currently someone sitting on the throne in Jerusalem today that is a descendant of David whose kingdom is never going to end? And the answer would be no. But there will be one day. And we know that person will be Jesus Christ. That promise will be fulfilled. And Jesus, he told his disciples that they would have a home in heaven. And they did. But they did not receive it until they died, which was many years later. The same goes for us. God does not promise to alleviate the things that we're going through in this life. He rather gives us his promise in his words that ultimately that this kingdom that we're living in here on earth is a temporary kingdom. And that although we are citizens here, this kingdom is going to be displaced one day by the real kingdom. You think about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Each of them said, I'm on a pilgrimage. I'm only passing through. And as Christians, that's all we're doing. We're only passing through. We're on our way to something that's far better. That's a promise we look forward to. And that's what Jeremiah 29 and 11 says. That is your future and your hope. See, one day, everything will be made right. All injustices will be corrected. And Jesus will reign as truly King of kings and Lord of lords. And he will bring to end all wars against, and he will bring judgment on all those who have come against him and his bride. These things will happen. They're promised in the Bible. But have they happened yet? No, but, but ultimately what does that promise do for us here and now? In present circumstances, but it gives us a hope, doesn't it? It changes our hope. And when, and when you have something to look forward to, then you have hope, don't you? And I want to share this little quote about what hope is. It says, Hope is faith in an immutable promise that miracles prevail when the darkness tries to win out with cries of despair. Hope is a gift from God that helps us yearn and live a life that believes and moves with the pledge of a better tomorrow. And what's more, hope springs forth resurrection life and draws us near to the love of Christ, who is the light of God who walked out from the grave to make the way for everlasting life. See, last week we celebrated the foundation for our hope, didn't we? And that is the empty tomb. New life, the promise of restoration and the fulfillment of God's promises, all things that are found in Christ Jesus. We celebrated the foundation of that last week, which Jeremiah 29 11 was pointing to, that future and we hope, and that hope that we have in Christ. So how can we have that hope in Christ? Well, through the promise of relationship, point number three. You see, within verses 12 through 14, there are several I will statements there. And read those verses with me. A God through Jeremiah says to the nation of Israel, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Well, if you look at those first three words there, those verses, verse 12 with me, what do those first three words say? Then you will. You will what? Well, you call upon me, is what God says. Then you will call upon me and come to pray to me, and I will hear you. That's the way God works through our trials and circumstances. He knows our human nature and our tendency to drift. That's not a nature we're going to get away with this side of heaven. And he knows what we are. And so he knows what help we need. He knows that when we get saved that we aren't perfect yet. Because if we were perfect, we would go straight on to heaven. He knows that we have need of a process to go through that will daily, bit by bit, make us more like Jesus. He knows that ultimately we won't like it because it goes against our very nature. But go through what we must. Why? You may say. Because in the end it will show us, it will remind us who we really need to be depending on, on it. Who we need to be relying on. And when we get to that point in our lives, we will call out to him as Jeremiah says. And we will come and pray to him as Jeremiah says. And God says that he will what in response to us? He will hear us. He will hear you. Verse 13 says, this is how this works. You will seek me and find me, says God, when you seek me with all of your heart. 
When was the last time you truly saw God with your whole heart? That's what that verse is saying. You know, I think that's a question that we all could bear asking ourselves every now and then because it shows us where we are in our relationship with Him. It's a good thermometer for whether we are, where we're at in our relationship with Him. Are we lukewarm? Are we cold? Or are we hot? And if we're not seeking Him with our whole heart, the question is, is are we really seeking Him at all? Are we being sincere? And much less will we find Him if we're not seeking Him with our whole heart. And I think the answer is, is that no, we won't. The Lord says that when we do this, that He will be found by us. We will find that anchor, that rock that we should have never drifted away from in the first place. And then our relationship with Him will be restored. You know, have you ever been through your house before at night when, you know, it's really dark outside? Let's say the electricity is off for whatever reason, and the stars aren't shining, and the moon's covered up by clouds. It's, it's really dark when it's like that, isn't it? But if you're like me and most people, you kind of have your house memorized. And so as you're walking about in the house, you know where different things are. So you know not to, to go over this direction because you're liable to trip over the, um, the end table or a chair or something that was left on the floor. So you know those things are there. But there's also times where you get disoriented. And you know you're in your house, but you're not real sure where exactly some things may be. And that's when we walk around with our hands out trying to, to find anything that we can touch so we can get our bearings are to, as to where we're at in the house. You see, the Christian life is like that sometimes. We get disoriented because we drift away from the rock. We drift away from our foundation, and then when we come to our senses, we realize we don't know the way to go. So we reach out until we find something that reassures us, that reorients us to the way that we should go. And God says that He is that something, that He is that rock and that we are, when we earnestly seek him with our whole heart we will find him and he will show us the way God is a good God isn't he I, I, I can say that all day long and, and every time the answer would be yes and this is a beautiful passage of scripture in the midst of judgment being pronounced on the people for their sins but the two things that, I want to, that we would do well to remind ourselves of as we look at this passage of Scripture. The first is our relationship with God. You know, many have attempted to soften the language the Bible uses to describe this relationship, haven't they? You know, they try to give this image that Jesus is your pal, that Jesus is your good buddy. So in other words, he is somebody you can go to at any time, and then when you're ready, you can get up and leave, and he'll always be there waiting for you to come back. That, that he, is, he is just like your bosom buddy. But that's not what the Bible says at all, is it? You see, God is described in the Bible as our creator, as our Lord and master. For us to have salvation, he has to be accepted by us as our Lord and master. And the Greek word often used for that is kurios, which means Lord. And, and then we are described as his slaves. We are described as his doulos. That's the Greek word for slaves. And I'm not trying to associate this in any way with the negative imagery that slavery presents because that's not what the Bible is trying to show. But instead, it's a picture given by God of the relationship that we are to have with him. He is our Lord and we are his servants. And as such, when he gives us commands, when a master gives commands to their servants, we are to obey without questioning what we are commanded to do. And then that's where the friendship comes in. Because then Jesus says in John 15, 15, No longer do I call you servants, that word doulos. For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Why? For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Well, looking at that verse, did you catch that relationship language that is in John 15, 15? Jesus says that when he has revealed to us the Father's will, that he then calls us a friend. And then he says later that the friend goes and bears fruit and that fruit abides. Well, what's the key connection there? Obedience. So we can't worry about, well, I need to do everything God wants me to do so I can have salvation. That's not what that verse is saying. What that verse is saying is that our obedience shows that relationship we have with God in the first place. That saving relationship. The next thing I want to point out is many have chosen Jeremiah 29 11 as their life verse. And I said that earlier. And that's a great verse to have. 
But if they've taken that life verse out of context and they've done so in a bad way, what do we mean by that, Pastor? What do you mean by taking that out of context? Well, I mean simply this. This is a promise of reservation in Jeremiah 29, 11. But it's a promise to come. Nowhere in this verse does God promise that things would go smoothly and that they would prosper. Everything is looking towards the future. Nowhere in these verses does God promise the children of Israel that he would take away all of their pain and their suffering, but he does promise deliverance. Look at the, look at the remainder of verse 14 with me. God says through Jeremiah, I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Now, if you pay any attention to the nation of Israel today, you know that all that I promise is not fulfilled yet. It's on its way to being fulfilled because day by day, the Jews are coming back. God is drawing his people back. That promise will be fulfilled. It may not be fulfilled in the immediate future, in our lifetimes, but it will be fulfilled in the future. Deliverance is coming. You know, I, uh, my wife Kimberly years ago bought me a present, and it's a picture of frame, and it has Jeremiah 29 11 in it. And, and then the frame itself is this nice harbor with these, it's an oil painting, I love oil paintings, it's an oil painting of a harbor with ships in it, and it's so peaceful, and you just, and it's in the distance, and, 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 and in the picture yourself, it, it gives you the idea that you're walking down a hill going towards that harbor, and I think that picture so epitomizes what that verse is saying, is that there is rest, there is deliverance, there is restoration to come, but it's in the future. Deliverance is coming. The question is, is are you ready? So what does this mean for us? How does this apply to our lives? Well, it simply means this is that we don't give up. You know, the Apostle Paul describes the, the life of a Christian as running a race. And any good runner knows that if you're going to run a race well, you don't shorten your stride, do you? You don't long, run with long strides and then halfway through decide you're going to take shorter strides because I won't you to win the race. Neither do you go and sit on the grass beside the track and expect to run the race well. That's not how it works because, you see, we're all in the race together. We can't sit off to the side and watch others go by. We're in that race, and we have to run it well. Instead, to run the race well, we need to run it by faith. And we run toward a finish line that we cannot see and to a God that we cannot see. And we're not bothered by that because of the faith that we have in those things. You see, God, he's not concerned about his plan for us. God had a plan for the people of Israel and he has a plan for us. He's not concerned about his plan. He just wants us to have faith in his plan. That's what sanctification means. And everyone who is a child of God goes through. Some more intently than others. See, his plan for us is to make us more like Christ. And we all go through that. Some have to go through it a little bit more intently than others. But we all, as Christians, as believers, we go through that process of becoming more like Christ. And that's usually through these trials and hardships that we face. So his concern is not for his plan. It's our faith in it that he wants us to have. That's why he tells us now that what he's going to do later He's going to give us that apple to look forward to. He's going to give us this assurance that we need to face the trials and struggles that we have today by giving us something to hope for in the future. You may say, well, how in the world does that point us to Jesus then? Well, these plans are God's plans, and although we don't know the full depth, the breadth, and everything, the extent of them, there is no need for us to feel anxiety or fear or worry or discouragement because they are his plans and he knows them. And it points us to Jesus because we know him and we can trust him because they are his plans. So my question is this, is do you know Jesus today? If I were to come to your house Today or tomorrow or any day, if I were to come to your house and ask you if you knew for certain what God is doing, the things in your life that he is doing, could you tell me? 
If I asked you if you knew that beyond a shadow of a doubt, and what that means is that you did not have the tiniest shred of doubt of all, if I asked you that beyond a shadow of a doubt that you would go to heaven when you died, that you knew Jesus and that he was your Lord and Savior, could you say, yes, I do, Pastor, and then could you give me evidence for that? You see, we live in troubling times, and I'm afraid that they were only going to get worse. And why can I say that? Because the Bible says it's going to happen. And as I think we've seen over these last few weeks, if nothing else, they have shown us that maybe where we've been placing our attention or focus is not really where we've been needing to place our attention and focus in the first place. I said last week that those things that we thought were so, thought were so rock solid, that they were immovable, they were like concrete, they basically were fragile because God has taken them away. And he's using this time to remind us of what's important. And one very big thing that's important is where will we spend our eternity? Where will you spend yours? Could you tell me? If you're on Facebook watching this, share with me. Where will you spend your eternity? I'd like to know. Use that as a testimony to others. Tell them your salvation story. Show them how God has worked in your life because that's the hope that you look forward to in the future. And then for Christians... The reminder is that we know him and we can then trust his plans. Although we don't know the full extent of his plans, we don't know what he is doing ultimately in the midst of these plans. We know what the end result is going to be. And so we, be, we should be seeking him with our whole hearts and walking in obedience to the way that he has given us to walk in. I encourage anyone today if they don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, then, then they reach out to the church in some way. Leave a message on Facebook. You can private message me if you want to. Any way that you want to try to gain contact with you, I, contact us. I encourage you to do so. I would like to share with you how you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have a home in heaven, that you can have this hope that God is talking about in Jeremiah 29, 11. Because there's hope for a future. And in days like we've been experiencing here recently, we need to have that hope. I want to end with a quote that I found. The quote goes like this. It says, Faithful to hit with courage, while unbelief looks back with complaint. I pray that today may we all be looking forward with our faith and courage. Go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you that we can again Study your word today, Father, in Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14, and just to be reminded that in the midst of great trial and tribulation and hardship that you have a plan, and it is a beautiful plan, and that plan is to make us more like Christ. If we don't know Christ as our Lord and Savior, then, then the plan is, is not for us. We, the only thing we have to look forward to is punishment, that separation from God. We don't have a hope in the future. We have judgment and condemnation. But for those who are believers... We have a hope in the future, and that's found in Christ through the promise of relationship with him. And I think God lays that out beautifully for us. He says, when you seek me with your whole heart, I will be found of you. When you come and pray, I will be found, and I will hear, and I will do these things. Oh, Lord, may we do those things. Lord, may we be just walking with you day by day. When we stray, Lord, bring us back, I pray. And Help us to come back and, and to realize that the relationship that we have with you is one of being your servant. Yes, we are your friend, and we need to be your friend through obedience, and that needs to be seen in our lives. As James says, your work shows the faith that you have in him. It doesn't save you, but it shows the relationship you have with God, and I just wonder where are the works at today? Where is the proof of that relationship? That's why I said, could you give me the evidence of it? If you were in a court of law, would you be feeling guilty as being a Christian? Lord, I pray, may that conviction be on everyone's heart today. And may they live it out. And I encourage those who don't know Christ as a Savior, Lord, that I'm not going to offer a prayer for them over the, the social media, but I encourage them to, to reach out, and I would love to speak with them one-on-one -on -one and lead them, because I believe that that, is, that that is what evangelism is really all about, is that interaction one-on-one -on -one with others. May today be the day of our salvation. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you do for us and all that you have done.
Go with us as we go our separate ways, Father. I pray lift this pandemic, Lord. Restore us back to where we were before, Father, but with a greater knowledge of what's important in our lives. Help us not to lose sight of that. And help us to share the love of Jesus with others because the fields are ripe to the harvest, especially now. May we give them a hope and a future to look forward to as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.